from verse 36 and we get to chapter 25. <coughs> Following the signs of Christ's coming, verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch, therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. May God in his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's say to the Matthew chapter 24, Verse 42, words of our Saviour, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord hath come. Our subject this evening will be Christ teaches spiritual shepherds. Well, we've made a little series of this, looking at how Christ shaped his disciples, the future apostles. In other words, I suppose we have been following the apostolic seminary 
looking particularly at the, the, the scriptures that were addressed exclusively to them. And as soon as you mark the passages that are addressed particularly to them, you see the full sense of them. Of course, they're all words of Christ that are suitable for everyone, and are full of great principles and important teaching and vital promises. But once you note those passages that are specifically to them and not to the wider public, public though they have a wider meaning, you see a much more profound sense the full implications of what he was saying to them. And there are a number, not many, but a number of parables that were spoken exclusively to the disciples. Now, while I believe firmly that all the parables are equally suitable for all people born, and they all demonstrate powerful evangelistic reasoning, they're all eminently suitable for gospel reasoning, yet the primary sense of those that we find here in Matthew 24, and at least in the first part of Matthew 25, were part of the syllabus of the seminary course for the future apostles. So they have a primary ethical sense to the apostles. And that does not in any way do away with their application to lost souls and the use that could and should be made of them as part of evangelistic reason. But if we started down here at verse 42, I'm going to go back a few verses in a moment. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And we'll look at what follows the, the immediate parable uh, from verse 43, and then a second in that chapter, and then a third which is in the beginning of chapter 25. And it is possible that from verse 14 of chapter 25 is also an exclusive parable primarily for the apostles. But you can't be absolutely certain uh, of that because in slightly different form, it appears, as I'm sure you know, in Luke's gospel in a more public setting. So it could be that what we read here in Matthew 25, verse 14 and on, is uh, uh, the essential parable as applied ethically to the pastoral conduct of the future apostles and also then its wider application given in a repeated telling to the public. But I'm not going to deal with that this evening. Those that we can more certainly say were primarily or first of all exclusively addressed to the apostles. If you'd like to go first of all to Matthew 24 and verse 36. At that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, unexpected entirely, of course, by the unsaved. Expected by believers, because we so clearly taught, but even we, know not when, the year, the day, the hour, only the day and the hour are mentioned here, but we cannot tell. We feel more and more convinced in these days that we must be at the very end of time, in the very last days. There are so many signs and predictions which seem to apply uniquely in our time. Well, I won't go into that right now, but that's how the passage begins here in verse 36, that uh, you cannot say exactly when. But then you're given information about the unexpected nature to the unsaved of the Lord's return. Verse 37, but as in the days, as the days of Noah were, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. And so it is, entirely unexpected by the unregenerate. And the Lord Jesus Christ goes back to Noah and the construction of the ark. And I need hardly say how remarkable that was, that that was that uh, giant vessel being constructed over so very many years by Noah as a testimony to the flood that God would send and the world in general took no notice of it at all. 
and uh, just took it in their stride. And they went on living life. Verse 38, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Noah uh, endeavored, we learn elsewhere, to preach to them through that time. So there was a proclamation of warning going on. And then there was the great uh, visual aid being unfolded before their eyes. And yet the things of this world were altogether more important. This world was all consuming and they heard no warning and took no warning. But it, it can be the same even with saved people. We all have the same tendency. We know the Lord will come. We know they can't be long, well at least at the end of our individual lifetimes. We know we do not have long to please him, to serve him, and to take that privileged part in the calling in of God's elect before Christ shall come again. And yet we are too easily consumed by the affairs of this life, and particularly so in days of prosperity, in days when there is so much money around and so many conveniences and comforts and luxuries. And Christian people get tied up with them and overawed by them. And yes, we have great privilege to have some of the luxuries and conveniences which attend modern life. How easy many things are for us, how much easier than they were, even in the lifetimes of many of us who are older, the changes we've seen, and yet we're so easily picked up by these things and carried away into excess and indulgence. And we forget, we're here on assignment, on service, <coughs> and we're meant to be applied for the Lord, for the King's business, and we're meant to have priorities, and time goes by, and the great portions of our lives, the months pass, sometimes the years, and the people of God are not productive, and are not honoring Him in many ways. It's astonishing how we can be just as distracted as the godless generation in the time of Noah. So it's a warning even to God's elect. And we read here in verse 39, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And it's an obvious application which you hardly need me to make. But what a tragedy. All again people receive so much understanding and light, a new life, transformed natures. And here we are with such good intentions. And if the Lord came, how dismally ashamed we may all be. And how much we could have done for him, our Lord, and should have done. But uh, don't let us be in the same position as the unconverted. And, uh, and then I want to go down to verse 42 because this leads me to a heading and it will be this. First of all, the verses we'll look at for a few moments will be about defense. This is the syllabus of instruction for the apostles. There are many different aspects, many different topics and things that they learned of from the Lord. But now this is about attitude, their personal attitude to their work and to their service. And uh, the illustration that's given the first parable is in verse 43. Know this, that if the good man of the house, sounds a little quaint, that delightfully old-fashioned word, the good man, it's a translation of a compound <coughs> word, which means really the leader or the head of the family. That's the sense. If the husband or father or head of the homestead or family had known in what watch, you know how those people divided the night up into watches of several hours each. Were they accustomed to setting watches? Well, yes, they would have been undoubtedly in those difficult days if they'd had a small farm, if they'd had a spread of outbuildings, if they'd had things stored which were precious to them, then at certain times of the year, vulnerable times, or if there was word that there was theft going on in the region or 
people came in and said, yes, they would set a watch. But somebody, some father of the family, has not set a watch. And so his property is broken into. Maybe the dwelling area, maybe the storms outside, and things are stolen that they need. Nobody except the very rich, who was rich in those days, and this, these were the stores that would feed their families and provide a trading margin for future months. So it was all serious loss. And here's the illustration. If the father of the house or the head of the home family farms had known, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up, be he also ready. For in such an hour she think not the Son of Man coming. Now I puzzled about this. Why in this series of illustrations to impress duties upon the minds of the apostles and of us, of course, in the long term, why the Lord starts with defense? He goes on to use an illustration after this which talks more about the establishment of the church. If you like, about evangelism, about the teaching of the people, and so on. And I'm puzzled as to why that wasn't first. But the defense of the establishment of the church, second. But I can't give you an answer as to why it's this way around, but it is this way around. Perhaps it's not as logical as we would like in a more scientific age. Perhaps there's good reason for it that I missed, but the Lord begins with defense of the institution. And that's what the first illustration is about. On our watch, will our church, or the individual lives of Christians, or my life, go undefended from assault, from trouble, from theft, from the machinations, the wiles of the devil, that's a big trouble today. All over the Christian world, I don't know whether I dare say it quite like this, but I think more so than ever before, the people of God have not been watching. There hasn't been an adequate enough defense. Things pour into the churches on every side. Things that are unbiblical and things that are wrong. And even good men who believe the doctrines of the faith and people who, if we knew them, would find they were warm-hearted grand pastors. Very often are they seeing things they should never have let in. They should have watched. And one day, tragically, they'll look back and they'll say, if only I had known. But in the 1990s, this would come in. And in the 2000s, this. And in the next generation, something else. I'd have set a watch, I'd have been more diligent. I remember some years ago, I went back a long way, I was sitting having coffee with a pastor in my own ancient generation years ago, and he was a bit rocked because there was a, a particular organization that had held big meetings in this area, a sort of national, so-called evangelical organization, and uh, he hadn't warned his people about this in advance. And so when he did so, it was very late in the day, and so many of them went off to these particular meetings that caused in his church great harm, great difficulty, great consternation. And he said to me words along these lines. Have you ever found, you know, that you thought you were helping and leading your people and you kind of looked around and found nobody was following you? And I said to him, not unkindly, I hope, but this movement's been about for years. Uh, hadn't you warned them over time? Hadn't you ever mentioned anything of this problem and these dangers? And no, it hadn't. It had never touched his area. And I had other approaches like that only a few years ago. A pastor who knew that we'd written extensively on a particular subject ran and said, have you got so what anything that you would recommend in print to give people to read about such and such? He was in the middle of great troubles in his church from something that had come. Yes, but that problem had been around for years. And there hadn't been any genuine 
gentle instruction or warnings to head off a difficulty. So we've got to be so careful. Elders, deacons, office bearers, pastors, venerable saints who see some of these things going on, we have to be alert and alive because we don't want to collapse on our watch because of our neglect. If the head of the family had only known that his property would have been broken into at a certain time of the night, he would have had a watch. But it's too late when it's happened. So there has to be a ministry of warning and there has to be care. And it's something which has almost always been in place because the Church of Jesus Christ is always under attack. The enemy of souls is always trying to launch missiles in. But that's not a good illustration, because his attacks are sometimes so crafty and so subtle. They're not big explosions. They're subtle erosions of things that come in. And we're so vulnerable today because of the internet because of all the things that people can innocently find on the internet, from you know, like crackpots or people who are absolute heretics or way out of line, <coughs> the this looks nice, I'll follow, I'll follow this, I'll get involved with it. And they don't know about the background of those people, and they don't know where they're heading, and they're so exposed to these things now. And you can't have a thought piece in the church and march around in a draconian manner, keeping watch on everyone, with a voluntary company of people who work on the basis of goodwill and earnest persuasion. So we have to keep <coughs> on it. it is so important. And even as I'm talking to you, I'm beginning to realize more and more why the Lord put defense first. It is so important. And that's what this illustration is about. You are defenders of the faith, he effectively says, of the future apostles. You're defenders of the people of God. You're protectors. You're guardians. To keep them aware. To keep them informed. So that they see the biblical reasoning. It's not your views that will count. It's what you give in the scriptures. That you're guardians of the faith. So we have to ask ourselves first. As defenders. Is my life here? Is my life clear? Am I as far as I can possibly achieve day by day filled with love and devotion for the Lord? Every office bearer challenges himself. And I made sure there are no idols creeping in to my life, in the home, in the garage, or anywhere. Are there idols <coughs> taking my time and attention? Maybe some of the legitimate things but they're getting too much affection and too much time. And I'm distracted from the love and service of the Lord. Am I praying? Have I got a full ministry of intercession? Praying for all people. And this is not only office bearers, this is all of us. What is the state of your ministry of intercession to defend the Church of God and other people and vulnerable people, new converts? We need to pray for by too often people are merely critical of young Christians who take a wrong step instead of prayer for to that the problem can be averted and headed off. So faith must be defended, the gospel must be kept clean. Oh, if only we'd been watching, we wouldn't have this contemporary Christian music subversion everywhere in the churches of Christ today so that a whole rising generation no longer know the difference between the church and the world. The people of God, the pastors, the elders, the deacons, they were watching. So defense is so important and the Lord puts it in a form that the apostles of the future will never forget in this tremendous parable from verse 43. It's something that first has an ethical application to spiritual shepherds, but indeed to all of us. And then uh, I'm going to come down to verse 45, which brings me to another heading, provision. 
the apostles of the future were not only defenders of the faith, but they were providers of the faith. They were proclaimers, preachers, pastors, helpers. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Well, this is a big household. From the sound of it, as the verses go on, it's again uh, when he's distributing on behalf of his Lord the owner of an estate by the sound of it, maybe the wages, the portion of flour, whatever, at that time, the portion of meat and provisions and other things, and he's a steward, a servant, and it's his duty to make sure everybody is provided for. It's a wonderful illustration, really, because he's not Lord, over this estate. He's over it. He's responsible for it, but he's as much a steward or a servant acting on behalf of another. Blessed is that servant, verse 46, whom his Lord, the owner, when he cometh, it's the Lord, of course, his return, that's what it's illustrating, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Incidentally, those are two very encouraging verses to everyone engaged in the Lord's service. You will be given the eternal reward, not on the basis of the numbers who you bring into the kingdom, but your faithfulness as a preacher, as a provider. What the Lord mentions here is the servant's faithfulness. And he goes on to amplify it, not the numbers. So if we're in a day of small things and uh, there is great resistance to the truth and the fruit that the Lord is giving in spite of our very best efforts is small, while we're faithful, we get the reward of those who have the privilege of reaping the thousands and the tens of thousands. But there's the reward in verse 47. But, the great but of verse 48, and if there be evil servant, the focus now switches, it's an unworthy servant of the Lord. If that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. Well, don't forget it's an illustration. In the application of the illustration, the preacher or the elder or the deacon or whoever it is, the spiritual shepherd, isn't necessarily going to say, my Lord delayeth his coming. What this represents is that he is not going to be a great believer in his accountability and the return of the Lord at all, in real terms. Verse 49, what's this? And shall begin to smite his fellow servants. Well, that means that he treats the people he's supposed to be providing for, the other workers on the estate, and so on. <coughs> he begins to treat them as his own servants. They're his Lord's servants. He has the privilege of being the senior among them, and he's to provide for them. But he's become very haughty, and he's treating them like his own servants. And he's pushing them about, and he's demanding various things of them, which he should not be demanding of them. What's this a picture of, friends? It's a picture of an unworthy shepherd who uses the church for himself for his own gain, for his own living, for his own fame and fortune, for his own advance. It turns out he's going to be condemned in the end. It turns out he isn't a believer who's illustrated at all, but he seems to have position and importance in the church, and he uses it as a sort of playground for himself. And there are many people doing that today whether they're these people who are 
They can bring money in the prosperity gospel movement, or even in sound evangelical circles. People who are sort of prima donna in their church, and all seems to be for them, not really for souls, not really for the Lord. That's what's being portrayed here. Shall begin to smite his fellow servants. He didn't focus so much on the smiting. He's just regarding people as there to, for him to direct whatever for his own glory and benefit and sustenance. And to eat and drink with the drunken. I think of the verse like that when I see clips of these contemporary Christian music rock stars behaving just like worldlings, behaving in exactly the same way, relating themselves to all those unconverted people and adopting their methods and their stunts and everything, and to eat and drink with the drunken. Somebody I know had uh, the uh, song of one of these ringleaders in this contemporary worship stunt in a service he held some years ago. And I said, well, why do you use that? Right. Oh, well, this particular song is sound. Actually, I didn't think it was particularly sound. It was pretty weak. However, he said it isn't heretical. It's sound. So I use what's good. Even though it comes from somebody who is under the condemnation of the Lord, for eating and drinking with the world and fraternizing and borrowing from and employing the things the Lord detests and hates for spiritual purposes. Dear friends, that's what this is all about. This is the apostolic seminary of the Lord. It's the Lord's way of instructing the future apostles to be separate from the world and to protect the church from the world and never to use the church as their own private business or to benefit them as servants of the Lord. Look at verse 50. The Lord of death, all his alive, the coming of the Lord. Verse 51. And shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Well, because we're taught in Scripture that we cannot lose our salvation if we're genuinely saved. This can only mean one thing, that that preacher, or whoever he was, was not truly saved at all. And that's why he behaved like he did. And an awful lot of the people who lived, lead the church down wrong paths will turn out to be famous. How <coughs> tragic that there will also be some good and earnest people who went along with these type of things and rendered their ministries fruitless, even though they will be saved, though as by far, as the Apostle Paul puts it. So dear friends, the passage, the uh, parables here, begin with the defense of the faith and proceed to the provision, the gathering in of the elect. That's what's all important. And then uh, uh, really we could have dealt with this as the abuse of the church, but I'm going down to chapter 25 because time is going on and this will be an exhortation to the apostles to focus their whole lives on that coming day, the Lord's return. And they did, by the way. They lived in the expectation of Christ's return, even though they knew that he wouldn't come for a long time. The Apostle Paul is like that. He writes, pressing upon believers the importance of living as though Christ might come at any time. And they were accountable to him. People who don't understand the Bible, they misinterpret this. They say, oh, you see, the Apostle Paul thought the Lord was coming next week, tomorrow, the times proved him wrong. No, the Apostle did not think that. And he quite clearly teaches that the return of Christ will be in some considerable time. And Christ is teaching that in these very parables. It's going to be quite a long lapse of time before the Lord returns. 
However, because they lived and wrote as men who were to behave as though it were imminent, and the day of account was not far off for them. In a sense, it wasn't, because all our lives are short. And anyway, this chapter 25, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now I need not explain to you, I'm sure, that uh, the kind of procedure which is reflected in these words is of uh, a bride, and she has her bridesmaids, as we would call them, and they number ten in this particular passage, and they all are expecting the groom to arrive late in the evening, perhaps. He's going to come from the town of his own earth and domicile, and when he comes, the bridesmaids will go out to the border of the town, at least this is what we think is happening, with their lamps and provide a festive, illuminated escort into the town and then enter into a building and there'll be the marriage ceremony. But half of the bridesmaids, they took oil not only in their lamps, but in a reserve additional vessel, so that if the evening stretched on, they wouldn't run out. And five did not. But I'm sure you're mostly familiar with this. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, he was unusually late much later than expected. Indeed, so late that they all slumbered and slept. And I won't apply anything from that. But at verse 6, the famous verse, at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye up to meet him. And the bridesmaids, the virgins, all arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish called upon the wise, to share their oil, but they couldn't and wouldn't. And while the foolish went to buy, even late into the evening, the groom came and uh, they were shut out. And in verse 12, the Lord said to them, when they applied to get in, I say unto you, I know you not. So the foolish bridesmaids or virgins represent people who work us for the Lord who are unsaved because they're shut out. But even saved people can behave like the unsaved equally foolishly and you won't be shut out. What a tragedy not to live our lives in gratitude to the Lord and in His service and doing His bidding. What a tragedy, friends, that is when that happens. Now, the wise virgins picture people who maintain their devotion to the Lord in their personal lives, in their lives of Christian service. They maintain their labor for the Lord. They maintain their holiness and their conscientious concern to search their hearts and repent of sin and mortify the deeds of the flesh and advance by God's gracious help. They kept alive their desire for the coming of Christ. They could say, my chief desire. They represent the people who can say, my chief desire and objective is the return of Jesus Christ the Lord and his great vindication and the coming day. This is the greatest hope in my life. This is my focus. This is what I live for. And if I find myself drawn by Satan into foolish things and worldly ambitions just for myself and unnecessary things, I repent and I refocus my gaze on my belonging to him. Whereas the foolish virgins, well, they represent hypocritical shepherds and people 
who are not living as those who must give accounts and out of a strong desire to please and serve the Lord. The foolish virgin, man or woman, perhaps here, perhaps among us, and you live much more for the present than for the future. You don't live in the context of the great and coming day. You don't think of it often. It doesn't matter to you. It doesn't mean a great deal to you. It isn't your great consolation. If you're disadvantaged and deprived from promotion because somebody up there knows you're a Christian, you don't say to yourself, ah, oh, but my great objective is to live for him. No, you feel sorry for yourself. You feel very sore and very hurt. And there's no comfort because your mind is on the present. Because we've got to be responsible and do the best we can in the present. But it mustn't mean too much to us. It mustn't be our great objective. We have priorities, dear friends. But we can do that. My happiness, my comfort. If we're young, my marriage. The most important thing it could possibly be. That happens to us. I'm so anxious about that, but I understand that. But oh, it's much more important to live for Him. Let the Lord take care of these things. Never be made too anxious. There's just so much anxiety. That's understandable. But then you switch your gaze and your mind to the fact that you've been purchased by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You belong to Him. You have eternal life. And you're in His service. And then the marriage comes. And we don't see the young man, the young woman. This occasionally happens. Happily, it's only occasionally. We don't see them for months. Why does the greatest thing in the world is this marriage? And they'll make as big a fuss of it. Well, of course, it's worth making a fuss of. It's an auspicious occasion, it's very important, and it's meant to be. If you didn't mark marriage as great, having great significance, maybe you wouldn't take it seriously enough. It is important, I acknowledge that, but it's not as big a thing as the Lord's, as the world makes it, to fracture your life. So it is a vast thing, the biggest place is going to be higher, dreadful thing, the DJs are brought in, and it's done just like the world. And then I heard a few weeks ago, not among ourselves, but in another church, oh, I heard of a lady who'd had a 50th birthday party at the Hilton Hotel. What? Parties are for children, friends. 50th birthday party at the Hilton Hotel. With thousands of pounds spent and everybody under the sun invited. And I thought to myself, that little motto we used to hear a lot, what if everybody did that? Well, it would be impossible. Whether we joined the East, left the EC, or stayed with it would become irrelevant. We'd be all too busy having birthday parties at the Hilton Hotel for absolutely everyone. The Christians should sometimes ask themselves, what if everybody did this? Made the things of this world so important as I am about to do. Our priority is the Lord. And that great and coming day, that day which is a greater festivity than every festivity put together in the entire history of this vain and passing world. And that's what we live for and look to. But the foolish virgins were living for the here and now. And that was all important to them. And the return of the groom had become a hazy matter in their minds and indifferent to them. Dear friends, that day is coming, the end of all suffering, the sight of our dear Saviour, the uniting of the heavenly redeemed in glory and those still on earth, a day of judgment, the bridal supper of the Lamb, great things, the destruction of this evil world and its glorious rejuvenation and uniting with heaven as the eternal dwelling place of the people of God, the compensation, not that we look for compensation, 
we'll never go to the Lord and say, Lord, I lost this, I lost that for your sake, you owe me this, you owe me that. We don't think in terms of compensation. Of course not, because we have so much more than the few little trinkets we may have lost. But nevertheless, it will be a day of great compensation when every pang of suffering is rewarded with magnificent joy and peace and happiness and understanding and glory. This is the day that we live for and look to. And that's what this parable is about, the wise and the foolish virgins. Verse 13, watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Keep up your devotions every day. Keep alive your desire for the great and coming day. Keep your priorities, your commitment, your separation from sin and from the world, your prayerfulness, and especially for others. Keep up your protection of the church and fellow believers, and especially the vulnerable. You don't want phases of backsliding. You don't want phases, phases of no productivity for the Lord. You don't want to have to say, what happened to my life or to my church on my watch? Pray for the leaders of the church and God will keep them vigilant and give them wisdom far beyond their own. So we look just fleetingly and all too likely at the duty to defend and the duty to provide the word of God or proclaim and the fact that this has to be our chief, our main focus was for the apostles how they lived in untiring labour for the Lord and the apostle Paul about whom we know so much what he endured and what he accomplished by the power of the Spirit for the Lord. And so the great worthies of church history and reformation and awakening and we want to follow in their steps. So I close with the verse, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Let's close our thinking, singing the hymn 483.